fundamentally, coding is a practical skill. It's not enough to be able to explain how to write code, you have to be able to do it. And a lot of what you learn at university is theoretical. You learn to talk about software design, analyze code, evaluate architectural choices, which is not the same as being able to produce working software. So professional programmers learn a huge amount of what they need to know on the job and at industry training courses. If you understand how practical skill acquisition actually happens, I think you can make better choices in your career. Let me explain. Hi, I'm Emily Bache. I'm a software developer and creator of Saman Coaching. Welcome to my channel. I'm going to show a video of my daughter solving a Rubik's Cube. And I wanted to show this because I think this is a skill that has many analogies with software development. You need to examine a situation and apply heuristics and choose what to do next, execute those changes quickly and accurately, and then, based on the new position, decide what to do next. It's also quite an easy problem to show visually in action rather than solving a coding problem. The first thing she's going to do is trying to get a white cross on the bottom. So this is just looking at the position and then working out how to move the pieces to get that. She's got it already. Then she's going to do the first two layers. And there's again, it's look at the position, apply a sequence of moves. And I think that doesn't take long. She's got it now. And then it's just the top layer. So again, she's got a different sequence of moves to do to solve the top layer. And she gets quite quickly to a point where now there's only three corners that need to be put into the right places and then rotated. So she's applying a particular algorithm. Now she's got the corner, three corners still, but they, I think they're in different places. Now there's only two corners that need rotating. And then it goes really fast. It's really a sequence of moves she knows well and just all mechanical and it's solved. That was my daughter solving a Rubik's Cube, a practical skill. And I can stand here and explain exactly what she's doing and the moves that she's making. But if you actually hand me a cube, I'm completely lost. I've got no idea what to do. So there is definitely a difference between a practical skill being able to do something and a thinking skill of being able to explain it. This is the Bloom taxonomy. It's a model for use in teaching of how people learn. And it's got these six stages, starting from you have to remember something before you understand it, before you can apply those ideas to new situations and then analyze novel things, and, and it goes on. This is a useful model used by teachers worldwide when they're planning lessons. But fundamentally, this is all about thinking skills. You can explain why things matter, but not necessarily actually be able to do something the thing about software is it's all about practical skills. And I think we need a different model. This is another model. This is the Hartman Proficiency Taxonomy. And it's also got six stages and I've drawn it as a staircase because you acquire the practical skills in this order. Now, actually, you can put these two models together. You do need some thinking skills as well while you're acquiring a practical skill. But today I just want to focus on the practical skill acquisition part. Because so much in software is all about practical skills. This is a picture of some of the most important technical practices for continuous delivery. And I'm just going to go through some of the elements of it. I've drawn here test-driven development in the double loop format that emphasizes the fact there are actually two roles for the tests. The unit tests are driving low-level design decisions. The acceptance tests are driving understanding of the problem you're trying to solve and the context for the users. These are important practices, practical skills, part of coding. But also things like exploratory testing, when you're, you're designing a test plan at the same time as executing it. Pair programming, when to speak, when to stay quiet, when to take the keyboard. Continuous integration, how big a change to try and send in and, and integrate with everyone else's changes at once. And doing that frequently is definitely a skill that you acquire. Domain-centric architecture, something like hexagonal or clean architecture, they're all based around the idea that you, you try and put the domain language into the code. And how you do that is a really skilled activity. And then at the center of it all, it's just the skill of being able to write good, clean and tidy code that's understandable and easy to change. All of these are practical skills and these are things you 
don't learn at university, at least not in enough detail that you can really start using them on the job until you've had a bit of feedback and a bit of practice. And practical skill acquisition, that's what I want to say more about. This is the Hartman model again. I'm going to go through it and how you acquire skills. The first step of the Hartman proficiency taxonomy is familiarity. And this is where you hear about the thing and start to understand what it is. So getting to familiarity can go very quickly. It's somebody explaining it to you or watching a demo or a work walkthrough. I mean, before this stage, you had no idea this was even a thing. You'd never seen a Rubik's Cube or heard of exploratory testing. So this part goes quite quickly. It's at the next step, though, when you actually start to be able to uh, do this, but only with supervision. You have somebody standing next to you explaining the steps and you can follow the steps and you can do it. But as soon as they leave, you're stuck. So getting to comprehension is a case of getting a checklist or a video demo or, or a list of steps that you can copy exactly. And then hopefully you'll get to, uh, you know, a correct result. But as soon as you need to go off script or, or that person leaves, you're stuck. Conscious effort is the next step, and this is where you start to retain some of those steps in memory. So you don't need to always be returning to your list of instructions. You can remember parts of it and you can do the steps and usually get stuck and fail fairly quickly. But actually, you can start to do some of it. And this is uh, where you need practice, basically, on, on simple enough problems that some of the time you can solve them and get that, you know, rush of adrenaline when, oh, I, I did it now, and to reinforce the learning. So you do need feedback at this stage from something or someone who can tell you when you're doing it right, so you can retain that knowledge. But most of the time, you can't complete a whole problem. That's what starts to happen at the next stage, conscious action. So this is where you can remember enough that you, you basically know all the moves and you can do it, but, it's fragile. You have to be fully concentrated on this one thing, this new skill that you've just learnt. And if anything comes in to distract you or put you off, it falls apart and you, you fail. Getting to conscious action then from conscious effort is a case of facing a variety of types of problem and learning the solutions to them, and remembering them, and being able to consciously plan a sequence of moves to get to the result that you want to get to. And again, you still need feedback all the way to, to make sure that you're learning the best approach and that your success really is success. But it's the next stage, actually, proficient, that you need to be able to use this skill in your job. This is where you can be successful. You, you know the thing well enough that even if those distractions come in from the side and the, the stressful situation and your boss is upset, you can still do the skill you can have enough brain power left over to worry about all the rest of that stuff at the same time as being successful. So getting to proficient from conscious action is mostly a question of experience, doing the thing a lot and internalizing what the moves are. And deliberate practice can help at this stage where deliberate practice is when you deliberately pick a problem that's the right level of difficulty that you know how to do and just repeating it for fluency. Mentoring also helps at this stage where you get somebody else coming in and giving you suitable feedback about, oh, did you know there's actually a better way of doing that? I know you can do it, but there's a better way as well. So this is actually all you need to do your job. But of course, there is a stage beyond. There is the ultimate in being expert is unconscious competence. This is where you're so good at this skill, you, you can't really remember how you're doing it. You're successful and you can't explain what it was you did. It's become just second nature to you. So getting to unconscious competence, if that's a goal that you have, basically it happens over a long period of time with a, a lot of experience and um, a lot of uh, self-reflection uh, on how you've managed to face challenging situations and what was it that you did that, that made you successful. And at this point, it can really help to get a peer, somebody who's at a similar level to you, to reflect back to you what you've done and what they've seen you doing and, and how you, they think you've been successful so that you can actually start to, to think it through and work that out and, and make sure that's part of your future practice as well. So this was an explanation, an introduction to the Hartman Proficiency Taxonomy. 
You need to go through these steps in this order. You can't skip any. But actually, at least the first three steps can go relatively quickly. You can get through up to conscious efforts in a few days of a training course with a, a teacher, but it can be harder to get beyond that. It can definitely go wrong. I've seen this with skill-like test-driven development. You, you go to the training course, you, you, you're doing these little exercises, you're getting to conscious effort, but then the training course ends and you don't at this stage know enough to be able to actually solve an ordinary sized problem of the kind you might face at work. So you get back to your desk and you're left to work out the rest kind of by trial and error. And it often doesn't go so well. You basically give up and forget what you learned and just go back to doing it the way you did before. We'd like to avoid that. And there are some tips I wanna share with you about acquiring practical coding skills in a way that actually will stick beyond that initial training course. And one is just to go to the training course in a group with your colleagues, because you can support one another getting through the materials in the training course. And then when you get back to your desks and in your normal situation, you can still support one another give one another the feedback about the parts of it that you all understand. And if you put your heads together and over time, hopefully you can even get to conscious action. So peer support groups, I think is a, a key way of acquiring practical skills, getting that feedback and encouragement when you fail to carry on and try something different. So I've seen uh, successful uh, adoptions of test-driven development and, and all those other practical coding skills when you've got a good team together and they all want to learn. The kind of group that I'm talking about could be your colleagues in your team at work or maybe if they're not interested, a, a user group or a coding dojo or some other community events that you could get involved with. I mean, this was my experience. When I wanted to learn test-driven development, my colleagues were just not interested and they were giving me no support and I found that I was learning so much more from evening user groups with the, the Ruby user group and the Python user group in the, in the city where I live. I hope that today you don't need to actually put in your evenings and weekends to find time to train with colleagues. So I hope that this is a thing of the past. These days what I'm doing more is technical coaching. This is where I'm that person who's already reached a proficient level at the skill and I can take a whole team of developers and help them to learn the skills and get through their levels on this Hartman staircase. And hopefully, if I work with the team long enough, I can get them up to proficient and then they won't need me anymore. All the experience I have tells me that this is an effective way for software developers to acquire practical skills. I wouldn't want you to think that technical coaching was the only way to acquire practical coding skills. I mean, to get really fluent with skills like TDD and refactoring and reach that proficient stage, you're going to need to put in some hours trying stuff out and getting feedback. Preferably from a person with relevant skills, not only Gen AI. There are some very good video training materials available through the Continuous Delivery Training Platform and some useful exercises that I've described on the Salman Coaching website, salmancoaching.org. But in general, my advice is to try and get a group together, plan to work on some practical coding exercises and give each other feedback. It's much more fun and effective than doing all that work alone by yourself. Happy coding. <laughs>